afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Gantua Group webinar. So we will start with a, a short overview of some theory about the topic of standards and, um, and how they all relate to each other, but we want to keep that relatively short. And then afterwards, we want to talk about, so what should you do now? What, if you get a particular question from a customer, how do you answer that? If you get an answer from a printer, um, what does it mean? And uh, how can you deal with the, uh, the advice you get from people and so on? So we're, we're going to try to make it a little bit uh, interactive. We do have some questions that we, that we want to answer uh, already, that we know. But uh, of course, it would be very good if you have questions, just enter them. Um, as you think of them in the GoToWebinar control panel, and then we can get those answered uh, as well. Yeah, so once more, a uh, short introduction, probably 15 minutes or so, maybe a bit longer, we'll see. And then after that, uh, it will be more of a conversation discussion between uh, the two speakers you have uh, today, myself and Christian. And then um, we will also look at all the questions that, uh, that you send us and we'll try to get all of them uh, answered somehow. My name is David. Uh, my full name is David van Driessen, but that's not pronounceable in English. Um, to just give you a little bit of background of uh, where I come from, for those of you who don't know me, um, I, uh, I go back until 1996 in the graphic arts uh, when I started as a uh, as a developer working for uh, for Infocus and uh, those of you who have been in this industry for a while will know what Taylor is that was a postscript editor but as of 1997 I've been dealing with PDF um, uh, starting to work on Pitstop which still exists today and is still an Infocus product today. Uh, around 2000, I started uh, cooperating in a group that later became the uh, Ghent Work Group. Um, I've been part of that ever since. Uh, at the moment, I'm executive director of the Ghent Work Group. I'm also co-chair of a number of subcommittees. And I think I've had just about any job you can have in, uh, in this organization. Um, meanwhile, I've done some time that sounds very negative but it's not i've done some time at gradual software co-founded that and uh, you probably don't know the name gradual software anymore but uh, we were the inventors of switch which is now an unfocused product and then as of um i was going to say as of 10 years ago but i think it's longer than 10 years by now uh, I've been CTO at 4Ps, and 4Ps is a distributor, a software distributor uh, from Belgium, but we operate internationally. And we deal with lots of PDF-related tools, um, automation-related tools, and so on. So I've spent quite a bit of time in uh, the fields of PDF and automation and prepress and graphic arts in general. Um, so I know some things about, uh, about standards and uh, standardization uh, by now. So, Christian. Um, so, I'm Christian Blaise, um, and I I have quite a long time also in the industry. Uh, I should also update that we, we, we are in 2021 now, so it's probably over 30 years, oh my God, um, that I spent into the industry. Um, so, from uh, uh, I, I had several companies, several roles. Um, I started Let's start from the bottom. I studied at a, at a printer uh, in packaging, and then I moved to Nestle. I also worked for Enfocus at some point, and and also been a CEO at uh, Gap Systems uh, for quite some time. I also then I, I founded uh, and I've been the owner of Blue Process and Agile Streams. These are two consultancies that are offering a consultancy in. Uh, process automation and also in packaging. And I recently uh, joined 4Ps uh, to serve as a team leader of the professional services and support teams. Um, so I think that we, we, we made the, the whole presentation of uh, both of us. And uh, I give you back the, uh, the, the talk, uh, David, to uh, start introducing the topic. 
Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, specifications and standards. The what we what we wanted to uh, to do is just define the playing field a little bit uh, because we're going to have uh, more or less a discussion afterwards. But it's important to know what we're talking about. And then the first thing that I always clarify to people is, is some terminology. And the most important there, I think, is standards versus specifications. And it is because some organizations use standards. Uh, it's a very common word, obviously. Uh, other organizations use specifications. And um, that is, you can use it interchangeably, as far as I'm concerned. Originally, uh, what was said uh, by um, an organization, the Gantler Group, actually, was that, okay, let's use the word specification because standard refers more to um, an accredited standards organization. So let's let's use another word. And But in reality, when you look at what these things mean, when you look at how they are used in our industry today, uh, what the importance of, uh, of them is and how they work together, I think standard and specification means uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, it is the definition of what you want to use uh, often in a particular context or to, to accomplish something. Uh, but in this presentation and outside of it, uh, you'll hear us use these two words interchangeably. The next bit is perhaps, well, you should know this. You should know ISO. Um, ISO is the International Standards Organization based in, uh, in I forget now, it's Switzerland. I think it's Geneva in Switzerland. Um, and it is. They are an, it is Geneva. Yes, I thought so. Uh, they are an organization that creates standards, worldwide standards for just about anything. And uh, if you think that you never come in contact with it, I'll give you very, two very strange examples. Um, if you've, um, well, the first is uh, that uh, if you look at condoms, for example, very, I, I told you it was a strange example. If you look at condoms, all the materials in there, there are ISO standards that specify what those materials should adhere to. So the quality level of uh, individual components there is defined by an ISO standard. Um, and another equally strange but very useful example sometimes is that if you would look at a, uh, at a ring, a wedding ring or something else, then there is a standard for the sizes of rings. So um, if you, uh, and that can be very handy if you want to go to Tiffany's in New York and buy something uh, for your wife who happens to be in Europe, then there is a standardized format for these things. So that is what ISO does. It develops a, a standard, a definition of uh, either quality or what a product should look like, uh, interoperability, um, and it does so in a worldwide, um, in a worldwide way. Yeah, which makes it much more usable than, uh, well, what the mess we have, for example, with uh, electrical outlets, where every country has the idea that they can do it better than the, uh, the other country. So a very useful thing to have. And they also make standards, of course, in graphic arts, and that's why we're uh, mentioning them uh, here. So next to that, you have the... Um, second level, if you want, but I shouldn't really call it second level, is the Ghent Work Group. And this webinar is organized by the Ghent Work Group, so you should know what this, uh, what this is. Um, the Ghent Work Group is a, an international uh, association where you have vendor members, so people who make software or hardware, where you have uh, educational members from universities and so on, uh, individual experts that uh, are uh, in uh, graphic arts and uh, people representing industry, typically national industry organizations. Uh, Gantwell Group uh, exists uh, since uh, 2002 and what they do is they create specifications. Yeah? When I said uh, there is a difference between standards and specifications, well, typically what you see is that uh, on the ISO level, people talk more about standards. On the Gantua group, 
level in Gantua group meetings, for example, we talk more about specifications. Uh, um, we'll come back a little bit on uh, on what that is, but the organization itself has existed for, um, well, close to 20 years, and it brings together um, a, a group of, I think, 40, 50 people from all over the world to talk about uh, everything that concerns PDF and a little bit outside of that in, uh, in graphic arts. Okay, thank you, David. So, um... I think you're going to speak a little bit more. Uh, you, you have you have the lead now, so um, we, we we're going to, to define you now the different things that we have around the standards with the PDF, PDFX, and Genwa group, and then we go through all of them. So uh, I'll let you start, uh, David, with uh, PDF actually, and his yeah. nice name, nice ISO name. That it's probably the the nicest ISO standard, the nicest number for an ISO standard that I uh, that I know. Uh, PDF is a, a relatively late ISO standard. Uh, if I ask people who owns PDF, the, the typical answer that you get uh, is uh, Adobe, uh, but that is not true anymore. Adobe, of course, invented PDF and uh, started using it, but in at some point, I think in 2008. Uh, yes, there we go. Um, in 2008, that uh, the, the specification of PDF, so the technical documents defining the PDF format, was passed on to ISO for standardization. Yeah, and that is important because, of course, as long as PDF was owned by Adobe, uh, Adobe could make changes to it without basically talking to anyone else. Uh, so they could also make changes that broke the format or broke compatibility with the format. And that is not a very good basis to standardize software solutions and other things on. And by giving this to ISO, um, the process is, is now changed. And it is ISO that is responsible for new versions of PDF. Of course, Adobe still cooperates with that. It's part of the ISO organization and the committees that deal with PDF. But ISO is in uh, the lead. Um, there are, at the moment, and that is maybe also good to know, there are two versions of um, the ISO 32000 standard, and they are normally referred to in ISOES as uh, parts, so uh, 32000 part 1 and part 2. Um, this, uh, this first version is what we all use, so the uh, dash 1 version that came out in uh, in July 2008 is what we all use, what is in all software, supported by all hardware, and it is still very similar to what was uh, delivered and developed by uh, Adobe in uh, while it was still their uh, format. However, um, as of 2008, there was more work in ISO to further clarify some of the, the more advanced stuff that was in there um, to make sure that um, as a standard, there was absolutely no confusion over how it should be implemented and interpreted. And that was published as 32000-2. And together with the clarifications, you'll see that there is also some new features in there. Um, that was uh, originally published a little bit earlier than the date that I have on there, but there was a small revision to that to further clarify some things that were found. And that revision came out, well, not so long ago, in uh, December 2020. Uh, and that is, at the moment, the most modern version of PDF uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that you will use this or find this everywhere, because most software and, uh, and hardware still hasn't adopted to using this last version. In most cases, we're still dealing with a relatively old version of the PDF file format. Let's jump to um, um, the uh, PDFX uh, part of this. Um, so you actually can, uh, can think of uh, having everything that is around PDF, you know, um, working as those uh, Russian dolls and saying that PDF is that ISO standard that uh, David just talked about and that we're using uh, for many purposes and, and not only prints. 
Um, and based on that, there are things that are actually can, you know, uh, make problems when you're using a PDF that wasn't intent for print, if you want to print it. So that's why um, there's that standard PDFX uh, that has been uh, invented. Um, and actually, uh, the, the X in PDFX uh, is coming from blind exchange. And the idea behind that was being able to have a PDF file that you can send to somebody else um, within the graphic chain and where you, you, you sure that the next person in line can use your file without any problem. So that means that PDFX is actually a subset of PDF. So that means that it just forbids some of the things that you can have in a PDF and that could generate actually uh, a problem with uh, your file. So the idea behind that was really to be sure that uh, if you have to run your workflow or having to print on your machines, you're not being stuck at some point and not being able to go to print because there is something that is wrong in the file. Um, and then um, from uh, the PDFX, uh, there have been different flavors, as we call them. Um, and uh, it's uh, no numbered from uh, one to six. And basically, um, you, you can see here a list of a, a lot of um, um, standards, uh, PDFX standards. Um, and, and you can see here that two are in orange, uh, PDFX 1A and PDFX 4. And we pointed to those ones because these are the two that are the most used currently um, in the printing industry. Uh, so PDFX 1A is the um, uh, oldest of the two. And it's the one that has been used uh, since the last 20 years, basically. Um, and where it doesn't allow a lot of things um, and was really linked to the equipment that we had at that time, like having a PDF being, uh, you know, ripped to, to get the, the, the films where you had to go through what is called the CPSI, which is actually uh, a part of the rip that converts the PDF into postscript and then afterwards image that uh, postscript. So this was what we can call the legacy way of working, but it's still uh, pretty common. Uh, although it's it's really old, uh, it's still used. Uh, a more modern one, which is the PDFX4, and um, this is actually uh, the, the one that is, uh, I wouldn't say the most used now, but should be the most used, um, goes into the same uh, category of PDFX1A, but um, in a more modern way. So basically when you have a workflow that is uh, basically um, being able to uh, uh, directly read your PDF file into the imaging model, uh, which is what every APPE um, a RIP um, is able to do. So in, in that one, you can keep like uh, different, um, um, different color model and you can have uh, layers and transparency and a lot of modern things that are really easing the way of designing files. Um, and this is the one that is the, the, the most modern um, used now. Um, we, we also have two others, PDF uh, X5N and PDF X6. These are two uh, PDFX standards that are going to probably uh, uh, rule the world in the future. This, this is where the, the industry is going. Um, PDFX uh, 5N is actually the only PDFX standard that is dealing with N channel, meaning having um, objects that, that you know, consist of uh, uh, several uh, separation, uh, more than only the CMYK, and not only being spot color, but being combination of them. And uh, this is obviously uh, really needed uh, if you want to run like packaging workflows. Um, PDF X6 is actually, uh, it just has been released last month, David, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, um, I think so. Yeah, so it, it finally has been released. We were also working on that one for quite some time. 
and um, it's it's not used yet, definitely. But as the standard has been published now, then the application are going to take uh, that into account. So far, uh, if I'm not mistaken, as far as I know, there's no application that that is really dealing with this. Uh, I mean, like the uh, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud cannot create those PDF X6 files uh, at this time. Um, so from those PDFX standards, uh, normally you should be able to run everything without any problem. That's the theory, but it's not exactly this. And one of the reason is this. And this is why I give you back the, uh, the mic, uh, David. Yeah, so this is the problem that we're dealing with in, uh, in graphic arts, at least one of the problems we're dealing with is that if you look at what we're doing, what people are doing in general, then the, there is a lot of diversity in, uh, in our market space. Yeah? And um, that means that if you tell someone, I'm going to make one standard for the whole graphic arts industry, then there are a lot of things that you can't put in that standard. Think about image resolution, that's always a very good Example, what's the resolution that you need? Well, if you're going to print a glossy magazine, you're probably going to need something like 300 dpi. Maybe it's only 150, but it's going to be relatively high. If you're looking at the, uh, the bottom right there, uh, where there is a billboard, these things are designed to be seen from a highway when you're driving at, this is in California, so probably 50 miles per hour or something. And the resolution you need there is much, much lower. If you have 36 dpi, in many cases, that is absolutely sufficient. Yeah? So there is a lot of stuff that you can't put in uh, a single standard and for which you would like to have a different approach. And a different approach is what you see uh, on the, uh, in, in the Gantwell Group. So when the Gantwell Group started, what we said from the very beginning is that, listen, we're not going to make one specification, uh, remember specification equals standard, one specification for the whole industry because that's not possible. The questions that we got in the beginning was people saying, oh, if I make a PDF file for a newspaper ad, then uh, how do I do that? And if it's a magazine ad, is it going to be different? And if I'm just doing uh, sheet fell offset work, is it going to be different then? So what the Gantt Work Group has done from the very beginning and still today is to make different variants. And think of a variant as what a PDF file should look like if it's used for purpose A, B, or C. Yeah? So for each technically different area of the graphic arts market, the Gantt Work Group tries to come up with a variant that covers that usage in the market. And sometimes it's really clear why we have different variants and sometimes it's not so clear and things might change over time. I'll give one example and it's on the screen. If we ask you what is the difference between a newspaper ad and a magazine ad. Well, at the moment today, there might not be that much difference anymore. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the real differences in the beginning was that a newspaper ad could contain spot color because newspapers used spot color print in some cases. So black plus one spot color, for example. And in a magazine ad, we didn't allow spot color. Yeah. And then there were also some changes regarding uh, ink coverage. There were some changes regarding uh, a resolution again. Uh, but sometimes there are, uh, well, small changes between these things. Sometimes you'll see that different variants are much more widely apart than the things that you see in here. But this list of different variants is something that is still done today. Yeah. And then the next thing in there, um, I think there is uh, one next thing, uh, next slide, Christelle. Yeah, there we go. There's the, the doll. So um, if you look at what the Gantua group does, then you can complete this picture that Christian already had for PDF. Yeah? So what he said is the development of PDFX means that 
every PDF X file is also a PDF file. And technically, or mathematically, that means that PDFX is a subset of PDF. Yeah. Uh, at school, I, I was taught that with birds, um, every sparrow is a bird, but not every bird is a sparrow. Yeah. So that's, that's how this works as well. Every PDFX file is a PDF, but not the other way around. And you can do the same thing for the Gantua group. The Gantua group from the beginning decided to build on top of the PDFX standards. And so every Gantt Work Group compliant file is automatically also a PDFX compliant file. Yeah? And then you can take it further, of course, because perhaps I have additional stuff that I want to add in a particular workflow or at a particular company for a particular client. If I'm printing, let's say, business cards, if I'm printing business cards and I know that my business cards are always going to be double sided, then I probably will add a rule that says any PDF file should contain two pages. That is a rule that doesn't exist in the Gantua group specifications. It doesn't exist in PDFX. Certainly is no rule in PDF. And so that is a workflow specific thing that you, you, you add. But thinking about this, this line of dolls where one fits in the other, or the other image that is very often used is a pyramid. Yeah. Um, thinking about this gives you a very visual way of understanding how these different standards function together. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to point out something, David, as well. It's just like mm -hmm. we also use those dolls or the pyramid just to really express that. Uh, it, it's really included in, in, into you know the previous one. So like if you have a workflow specific that is based on again work group uh, a profile and you want to add some checks because you want to restrict that to something specific, I don't know, let, let's say we say in that specific profile of the again work group that the resolution of the image should be 150. you can you can do one where you say I want to have 200. But you definitely cannot say, oh, I don't care about the resolution or having a value that is lower than the one in the GAN workgroup. Because if you do that, then you will not be GAN workgroup compliant anymore. So you, you do not fit into the previous doll. And I think this is also important. Correct. And it also it's also important when, as a company, you think about your strategy on how you're going to do things adding requirements or restrictions to a standard is always possible and not dangerous, but removing restrictions, as you said, that can become uh, much more dangerous. So then you have to really know what you're doing and you can't claim anymore that you are Gantua Group or PDFX compliant if you start removing some of the requirements in your workflow. That doesn't mean it can't be useful, but you have to be a little bit careful when you start doing that. So um, this is basically almost the things that we wanted to show and then jump to the questions. And we, we prepared some, some questions that, that are typical that we get from the field. But uh, we already have some questions here that are coming from the crowd uh, that are related to points that we really just talked about. So let's jump on one uh, that is directly talking about the GAN work group, um, uh, David. So that one is for you. And the question is, if a printer chooses to accept only PDFX 1A files uh, and takes no responsibility for flattening, what Acrobat pre-flight profile would you recommend? Uh, is it GAN Workgroup 1v4 sheet spots or to edit the GWG v2015 sheet spots MYK to accept only PDFX 1A? In other words, does v2015 specification contains more updated checks? Yes, a very good question, and unfortunately one that is not so easy to answer uh, because <laughs> you're you're asking multiple things in the same at the same time, and um, it's uh, okay. But let me try. Uh, the first thing is, uh, if a printer only accepts PDFX one A, uh, that is fine. There are many cases where that happens today. Um, then what you should know is that the Gantua Group specifications, the different versions that you mentioned, one V four and two thousand fifteen. The naming convention we know is not good. Um, that's what you get when you ask technical people to come up with a name. Uh, so there are there are two main versions, 1v4 and 2015 are their names. 
what you should know is that they are both based on PDFX, but on different versions of PDFX. Yeah. So 1v4 is based on PDFX 1A, um, and uh, 2015 is based on PDFX 4. So that's one. So if your printer says, I want PDFX 1A, then uh, naturally, what you would say is let's go for uh, Gantua Group 1v4 because that is based on that PDFX standard and then everything will be okay. Um, that was the most easy answer and the most logical answer in a way. Then, you could of course say, well, probably there are some updated checks in 2015 and that is absolutely the case. Yeah? But there is no easy way of going from the Gantua Group 2015 specification to the uh, 1v4 specification. So you can't really take the, uh, the 2015 preflight profile in, in Acrobat, for example, and then just switch on, make it PDFX 1A comp compliant, um, and then uh, assume that everything is, uh, is going to work. Uh, and that is because the Gantua Group specifications not only have compatibility with the PDFX standard, but all the rest of the requirements that are in there, so the other pre-flight checks that are in there, are carefully crafted to fit that um, PDFX version. Yeah. So that would it, it might work, but it's a little bit dangerous to do something uh, to do something like that. If your printer really says PDFX 1A, I would go for the 1v4 specifications, and then you're certain that everything is okay. What you could do is what we just talked about before. You can add workflow-specific checks on top of what is already in, um, in the PDFX standard or in the Gantua group specification. Yeah? So if there are some checks that are more modern in the 2015 to a group stuff, and there are, then you could potentially pick those out and add them to a 1v4 profile and make that profile a little bit stricter than it normally uh, would be. But the simple answer definitely would be if it's PDFX 1A, you should look at Gentua Group 1v4 because that corresponds to it. If it's PDFX 4, you should look for 2015 because that corresponds to it. Yeah? And then there is a whole other question, uh, and I will ignore that for now, on should it be sheet spot or, or uh, sheet offset? What, which of the Gantua group specification should it be? Is actually a little bit independent of the question. The important thing here is it should be 1v4 if it's PDFX 1A. Okay, pretty clear. Um... I, I take the next question, uh, which was about the b basic difference between PDFX4 and PDFX6, except it is newer. Um, yeah, I actually didn't define that much on the PDFX6. Uh, one of the reasons PDFX6 uh, took some time to be released is it is based on PDF20, so ISO 32000-2, and so we had to wait up until the ISO standard is there. So uh, the, the thing that is really important uh, we, with this is that you have um, new things uh, that are really important to the print. You have a lot of things. And basically, like um, the PDFX is no more aligned to the PDFA for archiving standards. Um, OK, so that means that you can have files that are both compliant to PDFX for print and A for archival. Uh, which makes some sense, but the the most important thing I think for us is um, having you those new things that are coming uh, with the PDF 2.0 um, uh, standard is that you can have an output intent that is on the page level, uh, which means that you can have um, on on the previous on the previous standards uh, you had the um, the output intent that is global to you to your whole file. But here you can have that on a specific page, which means that you can have a file that contains the cover and the inside of a book, for example, and you can have two different output intents uh, depending on you on a page for the cover or you on a page for the inside. So that's that's one of the things um, that is new. Um, you have also the 
Depart metadata, which is um, a, a way to include some uh, some some data that I used, uh, especially when you do a, a PDF VT things as well, uh, where you have to to repeat some information. Um, and um, you also have new things about uh, how to um, to mix the uh, the, the inks, um, and you have uh, this this spectral data that are also included into the standard, which used to be a separate, uh, separate standard, uh, CS, uh, CXFX4, uh, that was uh, that you could actually add to a PDFX4 file, but here it's also included into the standard. And uh, you have also uh, other things about uh, annotations of four fields um, and those kind of things. So basically, these are the, the main differences between uh, X4 and, and X6. And I think that the most important, again, for us is uh, to have the ability to have uh, output intents on different pages of the same document, I guess. Um, other questions? The questions are actually coming faster than we can answer. Yeah, so uh, I, want to, I want to deal with one uh, question that is close to yep. my uh, close to my heart, uh, I think, uh, and that is why are you making so many? I, I paraphrase, but why are you making uh, so many uh, standards? Uh, you stupid technicians! It would be much simpler if there was only one standard. And I completely <laughs> sympathize. It would be so much simpler if there was only one standard. You have no idea. Um, However, that is not very realistic. And it's not realistic because things progress and things change. Uh, when we created PDFX, I shouldn't say we, uh, although I was at some of the meetings, when we created PDFX 1A, when ISO released PDFX 1A, then um, that was really quite a quite modern standard. And I think the, the, the proof that it was a good standard is that we are now 20 years after that and it's still being used and it's arguably still the most used uh, pdfx version out there yeah so that was absolutely good but what you see is that different companies have different needs different workflows have different needs that is part of it but also technology changes when we created pdfx 1a uh, there wasn't really that much of a problem with transparency because, well, Creative Suite couldn't create it. So you didn't have files with that. And so the progress of technology makes it so that standards have to evolve to keep up with it. And make no mistake, this is not just a problem in our industry. In fact, there is a mechanism built into the ISO organization to make sure that standards remain up to date. And that means that um, every so much time, they have to be reviewed and, if necessary, updated to comply with the changed reality. Yeah. So, uh, is it really necessary to create um, so many PDFX standards or so many different Gantt workgroup versions? Well, it would be better if it if if those weren't there. But unfortunately, for most of them, I think we can we can find use cases where they were actually uh, useful. Yeah? Sometimes it doesn't happen that way. So in the slide that we showed about PDFX, there was something on there called PDFX2. If you look at the ISO uh, website, you'll see that PDFX2 is no longer an active standard. This was something that looked like a good idea at the time, but relatively quickly people decided that it was a mistake. And so that standard was retracted. That's also why on that slide with all the PDFX versions, we highlighted some stuff in color because we feel that those are the important ones and yeah, the, the ones that you should focus on. And in general, for all these standards, if you ask me, what should I use and if I know your company, your workflow, the way of working and so on, it is not that difficult to give an answer. It's going to be A or B or C, whatever it is. Yeah. But if in general you ask me what is the best standard, then, then it becomes uh, much more difficult because I don't know what your workflow looks like, what, what market segment you are in, what type of files you get and what relationships you have with other companies. So. I'm I'm sorry that it is confusing, and I agree it's confusing, but unfortunately there are good technical reasons for most of these confusing items. So 
David, uh, so why do we have to to deal with those standards and all these things? Should, shouldn't you know the printer can use a regular PDF and uh, you know uh, that yeah. would be easier? I'm a designer. I don't have no idea. I mean, I make a PDF yeah. and it never works. Yes. So you can find all kinds of comparisons. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take some, I'll take one that is a little bit harsh. If I cross the street, I prefer to look before I cross the street. Yeah. Um, can I cross the street without looking? Yes. But the outcome has a, a relatively high chance of being disastrous. If I look, the outcome is all of a sudden much better. And in many ways, that is the same thing. Can you just use PDF? Yes, you can. And will it go? Will will that end well? Well, in in many cases, it probably will end well. But the chance of having problems during um, uh, dealing with this PDF or printing this PDF afterwards are just higher. Yeah. So the chances that there are problems is higher than if you uh, if you use PDFX or a Gantra group specification. That's unfortunately how it is. Yeah. And uh, you can ask the same question about PDFX and, uh, and Gantua Group. Should I use a PDFX standard or a Gantua Group standard? Well, if you know enough about what is going on to use or to choose a Gantua Group uh, specification, you're going to have a higher chance that everything goes well if you do that. Okay? So the higher you go or the more to go, you go to the right on this slide, yeah, the, 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 the smaller the doll becomes, the subset becomes, uh, the more chance you have that uh, things are going to work out well. Okay, so so like uh, I, I, I want to be sure that I, you know, have less problems. So I, I should go, let's say, get work group or workflow specific if the, the printer has a profile that he sent me. But uh, I just just have to be aware of which uh, get work group um, st uh, specification I use to be sure that this is the one that is compliant to the PDFX that has been requested by the printer, right? Yes, and the I'm... important part in there is the communication with the printer. You have that absolutely correct. Go talk to the printer, first of all. Yeah, okay. Normally, ask the printer would be my my first guess i don't know what to do so i go ask the, the printer but then if that the printer just like it said okay uh, send me you know send me a pdf or send me a pdfx um, and it doesn't mention like x1a x4 and and i don't know exactly what to do what 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 should i use what do i have questions that i have to ask myself uh, about what what should be the standard that i should use or are there questions that I should ask the printer to identify which one would be uh, the most suitable for what we do? Well, you would hope that the printer would already know. Yeah, um, that, that's the first thing. Uh, you would hope that as a printer, as a printer, you have more information than the person who creates the PDF file in many cases, because you know what the technology is that you're going to use to print, to print things on. Um, and you know your workflow, you know what you can deal with and what you can't deal with. So you would hope that if you go to a printer and ask what should I use, that the answer is not PDF or not even PDFX. Yeah. Um, if the printer doesn't know or if it's a cooperative uh, effort in, uh, to, to try and find out, then um, the how modern the equipment is and so on. And actually it, it shouldn't really be an issue anymore because I think by now all equipment, uh, if, it's, if it's regularly maintained, most equipment will deal with transparency PDFs just fine. Yeah. Uh, even in some fields where that wasn't the case before, we're getting to a point where the RIPs are actually quite good um, and they can deal with files that contain transparency uh, in, a, uh, in a quite good fashion in general. So um, if you don't know what to do, there are some defaults. There are some things that you can use um, without having too much information. Yeah? And the first one would be, I would, also, I would always go for, for again, to a group uh, profile. That's one. Secondly, I would select 2015 from Gantua Group that is based on PDFX4. And yes, that allows transparency. 
And uh, like I said, I think most workflows can, uh, can deal with that. So I would go for 2015. And then you have to see what market segment you are in. If you are doing uh, digital print, if you're doing sign and display, large format, um, if you're doing uh, packaging, if you're doing um, uh, commercial print stuff, then the Gantoil Group does have specifications for those market segments. And um, if you know what you're doing, then I would use the corresponding market segment specification. If you don't know that as well, well, um, <laughs> you could wonder what you're doing then. But uh, if you don't know anything, you just know that you need to deliver a PDF file. And for example, you don't even know whether it's going to be offset or, or digital, uh, that, that could be. Then um, the most neutral Gantura group specification is probably sheet fed offset CMYK. Yeah? Um, that is a specification that is targeted towards commercial print, but it has many generic purpose checks so it intercepts a lot of stuff but it doesn't get very specific and so if you don't have more information and you just know that you have to deliver a good pdf file but you're not sure where it's going to be printed and so on and so on look at that uh, sheet fed offset um, specification select the cnyk variant which only allows cnyk and um, that is a, a very neutral, good base profile. Okay, so that's a good good way to start. That that can also be useful when you when you don't know who is the printer, which can happen sometime in, in some workflows where you know that you have to design something and you have to deliver that to somebody that deals with printers, but you don't know which one it is. So could could really help. Um, Absolutely, but yes. just, just don't assume that we said always use sheet fed offset. That is not uh, this. Yeah. So uh, hopefully you have more information and you can you can at least select the right market segment. Uh, but if you yep. don't if you don't know anything else, then I would go for 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 that specification. Sheet fed offset yep. 2015, um, and then you are compliant with PDFX4 and um, you have a high chance that that will that will be compatible with what the printer expects okay so so i don't have to understand you answer as being sheet fed offset is the global generic profile that works all the time no it's just like i don't have any information i have to do something then it's probably a good start Yes, exactly. So if, if your printer doesn't can't help you, for example, or um, yeah, you simply don't know yet where you're going to send it, then it's it's a backstop. Yeah, but uh, usually you will know a little bit more. You know that you're in the sign and display market, and well, then there is a specific profile for that. Uh, you know that you're going to print something in offset, and then you have a, a something specific for that. So yeah. Okay, and 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 no, you know, I'm I'm the designer. I I I actually attend to that uh, webinar. I I got some information, but I, I'm you know, I, I'm I think I have a better understanding of what to do. But I'm I'm kind of lost. Where where can I find some information or just you know, I I don't really care about the content of the spec. I guess that the guys at the Gen Work Group they know exactly what they do. So. I, I can take that. So it's too technical probably for me to read those documents. But you know, at least I, I need to learn a little bit to understand how, how to work with this and, and and I need also to put that into my workflow. So I guess you're talking about profiles that some way I can you know find those profiles and do something. Yes, so a couple of things with what you uh, with what you say. Um, should you read the specification documents? God no. Um, if I could avoid it, I would avoid it myself. Uh, that's the same with PDFX, uh, which is also quite technical, and it's even the same with the, the, the PDF uh, standard itself. That's uh, more than a thousand pages these days, and a very technical document. So that is, you can out of interest, but it's not what you what you normally should do. Um, what I what I would do is I would look at the Gantua Group website, and I know this is uh, advertising um, 
our, our own stuff, but I think, first of all, it's the right answer, and secondly, everything on there is free, so you can just as well take advantage of it. But if you go there, you'll find a lot of things that are not these technical uh, specification documents. Uh, um, you can see that there are different ways to browse this. You can, uh, you can look at what, what type of person you are. Are you a designer? Are you part of an association? Do you work for a vendor? Uh, we have targeted content for, uh, for all of these groups. Uh, but what you also see more to the bottom of the page is that there is an overview of different market segments. Uh, packaging, digital print, sign and display, commercial print. And uh, those areas contain targeted information for if you are in that market segment. And that information contains a, a number of things that are quite interesting. Uh, I would definitely point you to webinars, for example, yeah, because the webinars are uh, going to give you a, a lot more information than um, what you what we can give in this uh, in this hour. But there is also something else that is quite interesting on there, and that is the application settings. And application settings are an an overview of um, configuration files that you can use for for different applications. And you can just download them from there and then start using them. Uh, uh, for example, if you're talking about pre-flight profiles, well, for the, the most common pre-flight tools, uh, you'll find uh, profiles that you can simply download. Or uh, if you download what is there for some of these, they will even tell you, don't bother. Uh, the the pre-flight profiles are already bundled with the application, and they will point you to where they are and how you can use them. Yeah. So that is that is certainly uh, very uh, very useful. Another thing that is very useful, and this goes back to a question that was asked here as well, I think, is well, you can set up your workflow to uh, to deal with, uh, or or you can in your workflow you can use the right profiles and and preflight and so on. But if you're a printer. Uh, how do you know that uh, files that are compliant with 2015, for example, or, or with 1v4, that they are going to be handled correctly afterwards? Yeah? And the Gantor Group also has a tool for that. Again, completely free, and your uh, you can use it without uh, by just downloading it, downloading it from the website here. But that's the Gantt PDF Output Suite. And the idea behind, behind the Gantt Output Suite is that it will give you small PDF files, which we call patches. And each of these patches tests a particular feature of PDF. Yeah. You have a patch that deals, or actually you have quite a few patches that deal with overprint. You have patches that deal with uh, transparency. Um, and uh, so yeah, so here is an, uh, an example of um, a, a, a Gantt Work Group patch and a person who can't configure their uh, Acrobat in this case. Because what you can see here is a whole lot of X's. And when you open one of these patches in an application or when you print it on a printer or send it through a workflow, then as soon as you see these X's come up, you know that something is incorrectly configured. Yeah? Either the workflow or the application doesn't support everything that should be supported or it is incorrectly configured. And for Acrobat, for example, you can switch off overprint preview. And that is what was the problem here. And if you switch off overprint preview, then these patches aren't going to look like. And if the patch doesn't look right, then you know that real production files will fail in the same way. Yeah? So if you have a customer that says, oh, I always use preview to look at my PDF files, well, have them send them some of these patches, have them open them in a preview, and compare that to what happens in Acrobat or when they are printed. And you'll you'll see that preview doesn't do it correctly, but a correctly configured Acrobat does do it correctly. Yeah. So uh, on the Gantt Group site, you'll find this, the the application settings that you can use, but you'll also find the tools that you can use, such as the Gantt Output Suite, to verify that your applications are configured correctly, your RIP is configured correctly, and so on. And that, of course, is an important part of the process. Yeah? You shouldn't just make sure that the files you get in are correct. You should also make sure that they can be printed correctly, dealt with correctly. Okay, good. 
So a lot of other questions that are coming here. So I'm not <laughs> taking them into any particular order of importance, just like the, the ones that I have on screen. Um, okay, you have a question here. What is the difference between OPM zero and OPM one? Ooh, yes, nice. I don't want to answer that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Remco, it would, it, it, it's not that I don't want to answer, but it no. would lead us too far, I believe, uh, here. Yeah. Um, OPM stands for overprint mode, illustrator overprint mode to be specific. And it, uh, it has to do with how, uh, how overprint is dealt with in, uh, in PDF. If you would search online uh, and we can get you a link uh, afterwards, I think there is a, uh, a webinar somewhere from um, Dietrich von Zechern uh, with Callas, who explains, um, if I'm not mistaken, who explains overprint and uh, all of the intricacies of overprint. And the difference between OPM0 and OPM1 is one of the things that is explained uh, in there. Yeah, so we can get you a link to that uh, afterwards. Okay, I have a question. I think we, we, we kind of answered that one already, but anyway, uh, why wouldn't a PDF provider use PDFX4, especially since output intent is embedded? So I think this is what you just said before, just like if your printer has up-to-date equipment, they mm -hmm. definitely can deal with PDFX4, right? The thing they is should, communication yeah. between the you know the originator of the document and the printer is is key because you need to understand what, for for each part what the other is doing so you sure that you don't get into trouble right yeah the problem is that on, on the one hand it's equipment and i think that's something else that that i saw passing by here in questions as well on the one hand it's equipment on the other hand it's also about uh, education and, and setting things up correctly. Yeah, um, even uh, even modern workflow systems, many modern workflow systems actually will handle PDFX4 files without any problem. So files with transparency without any problem. However, what you see is that if people start testing uh, their workflow with the Gantt output suite, for example then very often you'll you'll see errors and the errors are not because the equipment is too old or the workflow is too old uh, and, it, and it can't handle it the the errors are because the workflow isn't configured correctly yeah? and that in that case it can be solved and it's it's relatively easy to solve for many workflows you just need to know how yeah? Um, on the Gantt Workgroup website, actually, you, you will not only find the download for the Gantt PDF output suite, but one of the things that we require vendors to do, if they want to be compliant with the output suite, one of the things that we require them to do is to also publish instructions on how to set up um, their workflow. I think if you scroll down there, if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, you'll uh, there should be some uh, yeah. So if you go to the compliant one, uh, the go now button there at the, at the bottom, um, that that will give you a list of all of the compliant vendors with the Gantt output suite. Yeah, and for those vendors, you you will also find documentation on what you need to do, how you need to configure things. And that is perhaps even more important than the Gantt output suite itself in many cases, because it, it shows you uh, how, to, how to solve the problem. If you run the Gantt output suite and you have problems for these vendors, it will show you uh, how normally you should be able to solve the problems. Okay, so we, close to the end of the, the webinar as uh, it is already, already one hour. Uh, and <laughs> so I think that uh, there are many questions that haven't been answered, I'm sorry. And, and we're going to take those ones. And this, this can be uh, some material for next, uh, uh, next webinar, definitely, as we usually do. Uh, I would like to keep a last question for you, David. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, somebody uh, is asking about, uh, is there any issue when creating a, a PDFX4 initially and then convert that to PDFX1A? 
So then you, you could keep an RGB layered version and a flat CMYK version for the printer. Yeah. Um, oh God, that's a dangerous question. Um, I know. I know. That's why I oh. thought that to finish it, it was good. <laughs> so um, theoretically, no. <laughs> um, so let me explain. The biggest difference between PDFX1A and PDFX4, uh, there are two things. That, that are really different or potentially different. One has to do with transparency. PDFX4 allows transparency, PDFX1A doesn't, so that's one. And the, the second has to do with colors. In a PDFX1A file, you can only have CMYK and spot color and gray, of course. Uh, um, and in a PDFX4 file, you can have anything that is color managed. So you can have RGB images in there as long as they have an associated ICC profile. You can have LAB images in there. Uh, all of that is, uh, is allowed. So if you want to go from a PDFX4 file to a PDFX1A file, then what needs to be done potentially is resolve these two things. Yeah. And let me state, first of all, it is absolutely possible to make a PDFX4 file that only contains CNYK and spot color and doesn't contain transparency. And in that case, it will be really simple to convert it to PDFX1A. In essence, it comes, it, it is, it, it comes down to, 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 to modifying some metadata in the file. And it's, it's, it's very little more than that. There are some other things that potentially need to be fixed, but those are typically very easy. If your PDFX4 file contains other colors, so if it contains RGB images, then those will need to be converted to CNYK. And that is a first conversion action that potentially can cause problems. Um, secondly, if your PDFX4 file contains transparency, then that transparency will have to be flattened. Uh, the, the flattening process is a process where you take live transparency and you convert it into something that looks the same, hopefully, but doesn't contain transparency anymore. And both those actions, the conversion of colors and the flattening of transparency are things that potentially can cause problems. Uh, I would probably point more to the transparency flattening. Transparency flattening is an evil process, it is. It is a very complex process. It is different and many people don't realize that, but it is, it is different than printing something. If I, if I have a file that contains live transparency and you send it to a printer, then the printer renders it. And that is a different process than transparency flattening. Yeah? Transparency flattening can cut uh, objects and very often does cut objects in pieces. Um, it can rasterize some things, including texts. You can have text that is partly rasterized, partly live. There are all kinds of things that can go wrong in, uh, in that process. So theoretically, it's not very difficult to go from PDFX4 to PDFX1A. You just have to realize that you might have to do a couple of fixes that uh, that might have an impact and color conversion and transparency flattening are definitely the two big ones in that in that area so if you do that and you know that you're you're doing transparency flattening or, or, or color conversion um, you also have to verify that the file is still uh, okay uh, at the uh, at the end if you uh, can at all okay great um, thanks so much, uh, David, and, and especially thank you for having accepted to jump on question without any preparation up front. Um, it's always a dangerous exercise. Uh, oh, I, hope that, <laughs> I hope that you guys enjoyed the webinar today. Um, we definitely are going to be back with uh, other webinars uh, during uh, uh, the new year. and. Um, we, we we keep you posted of all the new topics if you run into specific questions you can you know always uh, go on the website and uh, send the questions to us if you have ideas on topics that you would like the genwa group to cover uh please do so as well 
Um, and again, we thank you for your time today and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.